Today is June 25th edition of Back Roads of Illinois. We were Central Illinois Agriculture. We were glad you are here on Back Roads of Illinois. The heat, end of the month report, flooding. We were seeing on many things to the commodities markets with the weather and corn belt and the Midwest as well, but there are a weather pattern is going on in the corn belt. The current markets has continued to decrease for right now. We see it in the Midwest. Otherwise, we were going to talk about the markets and the weather in the Midwest with Nomi Bloom from Total Farm Marketing. During this crazy weather conditions for this moment, we are talking about the corn yields in Tennessee with Marlin Beef from Comstock and down there in Nashville with Marlin. This time for your agricultural or commodity markets update on back roads of Illinois. U.S. ethanol seeking a relief from Brazil. Brazil is taking off for the tariff to the U.S. ethanol production. Brazil has been put on a tariff to the ethanol export from the U.S. They put 20% tariff from U.S. ethanol. The weather was rough in Iowa and South Dakota. They saw a lot of heavy rain in central Iowa and Sioux Falls in South Dakota. They had some issues with flooding over the weekend. The farm bill is ready to the Senate floor. Senator Stabano agree with the CPR program by the U.S. Reps. Plot Thompson, rank member of the Agricultural Committee. Senator Stabano agree with their version in the House. She concerns about cutting a few programs in the farm bill for the House version. This time is for the commodity market Sunback Roads of Illinois. Corn futures finished and down eight to nine cents. Soybean futures finished and down three to four cents. Wheat futures finished and down four to six cents. Now that we are going to talk about the livestock market for today on back roads of Illinois. Cattle futures finished and down eight to nine cents. Feeder cattle finished and down two to three cents. Lean hogs finished and down three to five cents. That is your agricultural news and markets update minute on back roads of Illinois. We were coming back with our guest Nomi Bloom from Total Farm Marketing. Please don't change the channel. <laughs> I'm joining with Nomi Bloom from Total Farm Marketing. Welcome to the show. How are you, Nomi? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about the markets with you today. Let's start with our conversation with the corn markets for right now. We were seeing declining commodity prices for right now. What is your take on the corn futures? Well, I have a mixed opinion on it. If you and I would have talked two weeks ago, I would have had more of a bearish outlook because the crop was starting along just fine and the weather seemed okay. And seasonally, this is the time of year that prices can sometimes start moving lower. But just in the past few days, my opinion is shifting because of the flooding in Northwest Iowa and Minnesota and parts of South Dakota. That's a really big deal that the market is missing because that area has such concentrated corn demand between the livestock that are there and the ethanol plants that are there. 
And, and for them to have thousands of acres wiped out just underwater, the market is ignoring that. And if the fields aren't totally underwater, they're a little bit too wet. And so we're really losing our chance of, of record yield in the western part of the Corn Belt. And then when you shift gears to the eastern part of the Corn Belt, we had big crop progress ratings that showed declines for the crop in parts of Indiana and Ohio because now it's been too hot and too dry there. So it's not a perfect crop anymore. And I think that the market needs to put some weather premium back into it. Uh, so we'll start to look at this Friday's quarterly stocks report and also the planted acres report. And then from there, we can start plugging in different yield scenarios. Uh, but I feel like the market needs to have a recovery bounce heading into July. And then if we get that, producers then can really continue to focus on old crop and some new crop sales too. Yes, <clears throat> ma'am, I hate the price. It's going to be in $4.25 because the demand is pretty tight. We were dry for central Illinois and northern Illinois near Rockford. Yeah, I've heard that the weather in Illinois has not been the greatest either. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind as well. This heat is really going to take its toll on the crop. And then we'll start to soon focus on weather for the month of July, which of course is so important because that's when the bulk of the crop is pollinating and you've got to have moisture during pollination. So again, I feel that the price of corn is getting too cheap here. I think we're going to start to see some buyers come in. We saw Mexico come in this morning and buy some corn because it's cheap. I think we'll see a little bit more of that buying interest start to come into play. And we need to put weather premium back into the market. We just, we don't have any weather premium in it right now. Good to hear that. Nomi, how do you see impacting the yields with this heat wave in the Midwest? Well, I think the USDA eventually is going to have to come down on their yield number. So right now they're sticking with their February USDA outlook number for yield, which is 181. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I would have thought that was possible, but not anymore. Again, with the heat that we are seeing in the Midwest, uh, with the flooding out in Iowa and Minnesota, uh, the yield number, I think, ultimately is going to be coming down. But if you look at history, you know, the USDA will be slow to change yield. <laughs> Probably nothing on the, um, you know, maybe a small increment change on the July 12th USDA report. Otherwise, uh, we'll be waiting for the crop progress tours in August before we get a little bit better idea of what's going on out there. What? I can't understand about the Department of Agricultural for today. Yeah, the USDA will have a USDA report on Friday that'll talk about quarterly stocks and talk about the acres. But then in two weeks after that, on Friday, July 12th, that'll be the next monthly supply and demand report from the USDA. And then that is where they will likely start to tweak the yield a little bit, hopefully you know, they'll account for this weather issue and we might see a slight yield reduction. But the USDA is a little bit slower to move on things. They would do a bigger adjustment in August if needed because they will wait for more data to come through. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, but in general, you know, the market right now, as we talked about before, has not been trading any weather premium. So we need to hopefully see the marketplace bring that weather premium back in and let prices have a little recovery bounce. 
The yield's nearly not so good. Okay, do you see increasing the demand for the beans in China from the United States or not? Um, it's a two-part answer. So we know that China has not been mm -hmm. buying new crop beans, and I think that they're just waiting for it to go on sale. And they'll probably come in and buy a large amount um, once we get into more of a significant price low. So that might be in the coming days as they start to catch wind that, you know, it's not perfect growing conditions in this country, or they might try to wait for a harvest low, maybe in late August or September. Then I think you're going to see them come in and buy. Um, they're, they're not going to buy as much as they have in years past, but they still need to rely on the United States for some of their needs because they need to buy beans from both hemispheres. So they'll come in and buy. I'm, I think that it'll happen, but it, there is some forever lost demand there on exports because of the competition that Brazil has. Mm -hmm. Is there anything would you like to go to be telling our listeners about these cattle markets for right now? Yeah, what's really important about the cattle complex um, is that it's been trading into a smaller trading range and into a narrow price point. When you look at the October live cattle chart, when you look at the feeder cattle chart, there's a pretty big what we call a pennant flag formation. And so prices have been going kind of up and down sideways in a sideways pattern as we're waiting to get a better idea on upcoming fundamentals. So we know that box beef values have been, you know, firm overall. The cash markets have been firm overall. Demand is okay. But the question becomes how much bullish news can we keep pricing into this market? And so trade is cautious to be a buyer right now because they want to wait for some more friendly fundamental news before taking a leap of faith that prices can go higher. But at the same time, prices are not interested at the moment to totally fall apart because the fundamentals are so friendly. So we're going to be starting to see the marketplace, you know, maybe trade sideways for another week. But eventually, some type of fundamental is going to win the day, and there's a significant price breakout coming. It could We don't know if it's higher or lower because the actual fundamentals will make that decision, but based on the charts, it's going to be a significant price move. So you have to be ready for either a higher or lower trade, um, and again, the fundamentals will dictate if the price breakout movement is higher or lower. Uh, but just a, a note of caution that um, there could be something big happening in that cattle complex. So just be ready for anything. We will see on the 4th of July because the demand is pretty tight and the other things as well. Yes, demand, domestic demand during the summer grilling season in the United States has been good. Our exports have been okay. So that'll be the question going forward as we, you know, reach the peak of summer grilling demand. And then as families relook at their budget and then start already thinking of back to school, the question becomes, you know, I think we'll still see demand for hamburger because it's just, mm -hmm. you know, so strong of demand there. But will we see demand for the higher cuts of beef? That's, that's going to be the question. Or will we see the United States import cattle or import beef from other countries. Um, so just, yeah, be on your toes, be ready for anything and uh, don't be complacent. That's the only advice I can give. And the holidays are coming. Do you have any final thoughts on this discussion on the segment? Well, again, keep an eye out for the USDA reports coming up on Friday. It's always a big market mover for the quarterly stocks and planted acres. And then we will have the markets closed on the
the 4th of July for the holiday. And then usually after that, we trade whatever, whatever the weather market is. Um, if they uh, put some heat in the forecast and no rain, we could see the market have a recovery rally higher. And then the next thing on the calendar will be the Friday, July 12th, regular USDA WASD report. So if we can get a recovery bounce in these grain markets, it'll be a great opportunity for some cash sales. So be focused on that. And um, I would say expect some price volatility over the next two weeks. It could get really exciting for the grain markets, especially. Thanks, Naomi. You're welcome. This is Nomi Bloom from Total Farm Marketing for your commodity analysis on Back Roads of Illinois. For the online content for Comstock in Tennessee. Welcome to the show. How are you, Marlon? I am doing good. Thank you, Caesar. Appreciate that. Good to talk with you again. Let's go with our conversation about your career in foreign broadcasting industry for two decades. I know you're getting ready for the commodity markets on the morning. Could you tell our listeners about your experience in the radio? Well, yeah. I mean... I was a uh, farmer myself for 25 years, and then I got into uh, talking about farming back in 1996 in Kansas at a radio station called KFRM uh, that was based in Clay Center, Kansas. And uh, for a while, I did farming and farm radio, um, and I talked about markets. I talked about farm news and that sort of thing, too. That actually uh, led to an opportunity in about 2002. I, I moved away and went into broadcasting full time, turned my uh, farming operation over to my uh, brother and some nephews and uh, moved out to Raleigh, North Carolina. So I, I worked out there for several years doing farm reporting and also some, uh, uh, I guess you would call it hard news anchoring on a news talk station out there. And that was a big learning experience uh, just because I got to talk to uh, an urban audience for a change and cover things like world news, you know, uh, things going on overseas. But I also did half of my time doing agricultural reporting, which was interesting. So I had to keep tabs on everything and I got to be kind of a news hound <laughs> after that. <laughs> Uh, I worked with a, a big news team in Raleigh and, and that was a good experience. Then I went to, uh, from there, I went to Western Nebraska to a big, uh, a network there, uh, the rural radio, um, uh, news network out there and KRVN radio. And that was the flagship station in Lexington. I worked there a couple of years until there was an opening in Nashville and I got to move to Nashville and. Gosh, I did TV and uh, satellite radio out of Nashville for 10 years. The further I went along my career, Caesar, uh, I got more and more into just talking specifically about markets all the time. And so, like you say, every morning I had to uh, look at what the markets did overnight. And I'm talking about commodity markets. I, I don't talk about markets in New York, really. Um, I'm talking about things that you grow on the farm or or something like that, or maybe crude oil. Um, anyway, we'll talk about that. And, and I would have analysts on throughout the day and I myself, and I'm not a market analyst, Caesar. I just bring guests on who are experts and I just interview them and I try to pose questions to them. Um, each time I do an interview and let them give their opinion on the market. I can't, I'm not, I'm not a licensed uh, trader uh, or a broker. Uh, I can't really give market advice. However, I can lead others who are licensed to uh, uh, lead them and, and let them give their comments on the markets and they can do it. So it's kind of a balancing act. And I've had to do that now for, oh my gosh, I've been doing this about 28 years now. And so it's, it's interesting. I love it. 
I've always been fascinated by the markets. And now, especially you get into a year like this where the markets are crazy. They don't seem to match what's going on out in the countryside. Like now we're talking about all the flooding in the uh, upper Midwest and the markets are going down anyway. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people. And so I try to get uh, guests on my shows that can maybe look into that and maybe explain why things are doing what they're doing or maybe why they're not doing what they should be doing. And uh, so we explore that. And and so that's what I'm doing these days, um, you know, trying to look at the story behind the markets, uh, actually more than the markets themselves. Wow, that's awesome. Marlon, did you grow up with some cattle in Kansas or just cropland? No. You have you know, bring the news for the farmers and ranchers, blue collar people who are in the Midwest. You know, that's uh that's a good question. I actually I started out, I was a grain farmer and I had just a few head of cattle. It was a cow calf, mm -hmm. a, a very small operation, but in the mid eighties, the farm economy was so bad. I had to liquidate my herd so I could get an off farm job. And, uh, so, you know, for gosh, quite a few years, probably about 15 years, I always had to have a job away from the farm to support the farm. If, if that makes sense. So we did that for a long time. So I, I had cattle until 1985, just, just a handful of them, but mainly I was a grain farmer and, uh, that was in Northern Kansas and Southern Nebraska. Uh, proposition but it's fun to work with i mean I, I love harvesting popcorn it's it's beautiful in the bin it's really really pretty and uh doesn't have much dust to it or anything so uh i really enjoy growing it and and it can pay pretty well some years not so much um, but you contract popcorn before you even grow it mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a different animal than trying to grow regular field corn for livestock. So um, it, it's kind of a closed market. It, it's almost like growing vegetables, you know, where you commit to a company and they tell you what, what they want you to plant and how much, and, and you go do it for them. And uh, at least in our case, uh, we had a clause in our contract where if you got hailed out, it was okay. It wasn't your fault. The company didn't hold you to delivering, you know, a certain amount or anything. Uh, it had what they call an act of God clause in there. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was a different creature, but, uh, that was one thing I, I was glad I had a chance to experience because it's, uh, it's almost closer to the retail side of farming. No, are you kidding? Wow. That's interesting. How do you see the farm broadcasting industry for the future? Online or stay with the radio? Ooh, boy, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a tough question. Um, I believe that you're kind of on the cutting edge. You and I both work on uh, online content now. I do podcasting and you do podcasting and uh, uh, I, I lean toward calling it person casting where you and I talk directly with individuals out there instead of uh, broadcasting over a tower and hoping someone catches it on the radio, you and I talk on demand. So this recording, someone can come back later on and play it whenever they want and they can play it again and they can play yeah. it. Again. So, uh, anyway, I, I enjoy that. And in fact, uh, I had a very popular podcast just earlier this week that had, uh, well, it's, it's still counting, but many, many thousands of, of views and it continues to grow. And it's, it's fascinating how, if you keep at it for a while, your audience just keeps expanding all the time. And, it's not, you're not limited to your local station. Um, you probably know too. I mean, mm -hmm. people can uh, listen to it mm -hmm. all over the world. 
and and then they can mm. share it and it just keeps spreading mm. out mm. so i uh compliment you mm. on what you're doing because i, I mm. think you're on the right track um i don't know mm. if radio will ever go away but i think uh the online content mm. <laughs> is uh it's kind of where everything is headed even radio stations are going that way because you can mm. drop your phone in your pocket and pull it out and you can retrieve that content wherever you are, mm. you know, through a cell tower or anything. And, mm. um, you know, listen to whenever you have time to mm. uh, listen to it. So I like that aspect a lot. I, I think it's bringing in a whole new audience to uh, agriculture and it's a lot more specific. You don't have to listen to an hour mm. of music programming or something that maybe you don't have mm. an interest in. If you want to catch on the markets, or catch up on the markets and find out what's going on. You can find a podcast that's talking about it and just play it. And it's right there. And then you can go on about your day. So I, I think it's pretty cool. Yes, sir. I'm a foreign broadcaster on this podcast. Thing is for TV personnel and famous stuff in the TV show. Otherwise, I am not podcaster. It's back roads of Illinois or not. It's your favorite podcast. Oh, <laughs> well, it could well be. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll say that. Uh, is there anything would you like to go to be telling our listeners about the Comstock? Well, Comstock, the Comstock channel is just a division of Comstock Investments. Now, they're based in West Des Moines, Iowa. Um, <clears throat> we have personnel in many states, actually. Uh, we're actually spread out in Minnesota and uh, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, Texas, Tennessee, and I'm, I may be leaving out some states here, Nebraska. Um, but anyway, we cover, uh, we include brokerage and we include insurance services and farm management and, uh, just all kinds of stuff. Um, it could be, uh, insurance for, uh, uh, property loss and that sort of thing, crop insurance. So they're, they're very diversified in what they do. And it's interesting where now with our Comstock channel, where we cover all these different topics and everything, sometimes it brings to mind some questions that our audience members have about, well, either what's going on in the markets, or maybe there's something that they hadn't thought about when it comes to risk management. You know, maybe there's something that they could be doing in options or something now is uh, uh, LRP coverage for livestock that wasn't even available a few years ago. And now that's kind of an option for livestock producers. And we're getting a lot of inquiries about that. Uh, so anything to help people with their bottom line on the farm and ranch, that's uh, what Comstock does. And it's interesting because we're, we're actually getting a lot of uh, people from around the globe now that are interested in our reports. And, uh, of course, our, our president of the company, uh, his in-laws are actually from Brazil. They actually own a large farm in Brazil. And so he has close ties with that. And we get a lot of inside information about what's going on in Brazilian agriculture, and we can do it firsthand. So we're kind of unique in that regard. And uh, I really enjoy that being a part of that. So uh, yeah, Comstock is is uh, pretty diversified, and we're really spreading out. And what we do, and our audience is growing every day, every day. And uh, you know, we we enjoy that, and I I just love talking with everybody out there, and getting feedback from everybody too. It's in the Midwest, alongside in the South as well. Yep. Otherwise, it's pretty important thing in the agricultural sector. Yeah, everybody needs to know how to uh, make money and how to keep the money that they are making. So that's what we're all about. 
Do you have any final thoughts about your career in the foreign broadcasting industry? Oh, not really. I mean, um, I did turn 65 last year, and that's part of the reason I got out of the uh, TV side because I was commuting 100 miles a day. But I still, I don't see myself ever sitting still and not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to maintain doing agricultural uh, broadcasting and reporting. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I had this opportunity to team up with the folks at Comstock and, and do it online. So now I can do it all from my home studio mm -hmm. and still talk with everybody around the globe. And um, it's just like a perfect fit. It saves me a hundred miles a day and a couple hours of drive time. And um, I can actually talk to whoever I want to talk to. I have a lot of freedom in that regard. And I, I sure appreciate the folks at Comstock for uh, giving me some free reign for that. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Congratulations, you real OG. <laughs> well, I enjoy what I do, and I think you do too. So uh, anyway, kudos to you, and uh, thanks for having me on. <laughs> well, I enjoy what I do, and I think you do too. So uh, anyway, kudos to you, and uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Marlon. I enjoyed our conversation. You bet. This is Marlon Boiling from Comstock and down Tennessee on back roads of Illinois. Welcome back to back roads of Illinois. This is your Illinois agricultural update. And Illinois has been cooled off on Monday, but the heat is coming back with the humidity in central Illinois. Otherwise, the weather is going to be up and down for next couple weeks in central Illinois. This is your Illinois Agricultural Update on... Thanks to Nomi Bloom and Marlin B. The time is running out for today on our show on Back Roads of Illinois. For Back Roads of Illinois, I am Caesar Delgado. Have a good day.